The Song of Tyadatha, Chapter 8 A Day at Salonique. There are many famous highways, many famous streets in history Watling Street and Piccadilly, Sydney Street and Champs Elysees, and the Appian Way and Wall Street. But the Lembet Road will ever take a place in fame beside them, while a single British soldier lives to tell of Salonika. Mud and slush and bumps in winter, bumps and dust and flies in summer. Still, it's filled out since we found it, since we got to work upon it, as a skinny baby fills out after being fed on bengers. There it was that Tyadatha learnt the gentle art of wangling, lifts in cars and motor lorries, down to Piccadilly Circus, in the days before the Bulgar strolled into the Struma Valley. He would spend the morning shopping, buying sundry brands of whisky, mostly made by local effort, at the most prodigious prices. In his hobnailed boots he slithered up and down Rue Venizelos, buying mullet by the oaky, buying tangerines and chestnuts. Shopkeepers would see him coming, cry with glee, here's tired Arthur, plenty money tired Arthur. After lunch at the Olympus, prices higher than the mountain, off he sped to baths of bottom tasted once again the pleasures of a bath you can lie down in. Though the soap was green and hardy, though the towels weren't all they might be, even though the place was dirty, it was better than a bucket. Good and hot he made the water, lay and splashed for half an hour, whistling snatches of a ragtime. Then, of course, he teed at Flocker's, cosmopolitan as shepherds, ever full to overflowing. In those days there came to flockers officers of many armies, officers of many navies, mufti wallers of all nations. Came the Greeks with swords beside them, gold and scarlet as a sunset. Came the Italians with their grey cloaks, French with caps like skies in summer, Came the Serbs, and came the Russians, came the English jocks and Irish, admirals, snotties, and commanders, colonels, generals, and captains, and a few bold bad lieutenants, poodle faking with some sisters. Here they met and fed together, drank their mastic tea or absinthe, talked their own peculiar language, Twenty tongues and yet one language. When they wanted their addition, wanted their perspiring waiter, they just clapped their hands together, loudly clapped their hands together, two or three or even four times. And in good time came the waiter, dodging round the crowded tables, as a cycling newsboy dodges in and out of London traffic. Added tip into the total just for fear they should forget it. After tea, a bit more shopping, and perhaps a picture palace. Fifteen suicides and murders in the space of half an hour. Then he dined at Bastasini's, dined at the expensive Roma, with his very best pal Percy. Drank some pretty nasty bubbly, sat and watched with the other diners, wrestling with their macaroni, watched a livery Greek major, more and more and more impatient for the omelette he had ordered, break a plate upon the table, dash one on the floor in pieces, then another and another till the room was in an uproar, till he'd got the whole staff round him. Stout old heart, cheered tired Arthur. Go it, Steve, cheered tired Arthur. That's the only way to do it, if you're really in a hurry. After dinner, off they sallied, to the Odeon or Tour Blanche, where you never paid but pushed past, crowded in the nearest stage box, 
or if it was locked, climbed over. Had you asked my tired Arthur if the show was very thrilling, if the lovely ladies sang him haunting songs of joy or sadness, he'd have told you in a minute that he hadn't time to notice. He was always much too busy, shouting un deux trois with Frenchmen, drinking lager beer with Serbians, swapping caps with ice cream merchants, helping several rowdy ruskies to lasso the band conductor, having special little ententes with the boxful of the navy, much too busy ragging Bertha, André, Denisette or Dolly, much too busy dodging Zizi when she clamoured champagne cider, and when APMs came prowling, he would disappear sedately with a beer mug in one pocket and a tin tray in the other, finish up a noisy evening with a game of Ring of Roses, then jolt campwards in a gari to valise and well-earned slumber. Do not fear my tired Arthur gently sliding to Avernus, losing all the pleasant manners taught him by his lady mother. Do not fear one day to find him clapping hands at Rumpelmeyer's for another chocolate eclair, breaking plates and things at Prince's when his lunch is long in coming, looting bear mugs at the palace or lassoing the conductor. He must do as Salonique does, for there's nothing else to do there. Some there are find Salonica dirty, dull, and evil-smelling. Bored to tears, they sometimes ask you what on earth there is to do there. But I make reply and tell them, Salonica's what you make it. London can be just as boring as a dugout in the trenches. Or a dugout in the trenches can be merrier than Murray's, if you've got the right coves in it, got a little drop of whisky, other climes and other morals. When you go to Salonica, be an idiot for an evening, make a noise with tired Arthur, drink your beer and pinch the glasses, raid the band and rag the fairies, dance a foxtrot with a Frenchman, get a little mild amusement even out of Salonica.